Hello and welcome to another lecture for my class, PSYC 770, Psychological Testing and Assessment. And as I pretty much always do, I'm beginning with a webcomic, and this one is from xkcd.com. And as you can see, it kind of uh, pokes fun at or has some fun with the idea of looking for intelligence, or let's say measuring intelligence. And as you can see, uh, you know, an idea or a point that it's, it's trying to make is that how we go about looking for intelligence has a lot to do with what we think intelligence is. And as you might imagine, or as you could probably know from your own experience and reading and thinking about this, those ideas about what intelligence uh, really is, uh, they vary across uh, time and place and people and perhaps even animal species, as this comic is suggesting. So anyway, today's lecture, Introduction to Mental Ability, aka Intelligence, I'll probably flip back and forth between using mental ability and intelligence. Generally speaking, I like to use the term mental ability because I think it has less of a value uh, burden than does the word intelligence. Um, but as you'll see in this lecture, I flip back to intelligence quite a lot because it's obviously the more common word and more common way of describing this interesting construct that, uh, that we're talking about that we want to ultimately test. So by way of an overview, I'm going to try and offer some definitions uh, for what intelligence is and talk a little bit about ways that scientists think about definitions as such and consider how those definitions differ across experts and non-experts and if and how they differ across cultures. I'm then going to talk a little bit about factor analysis. Now I know I've mentioned factor analysis before in uh, one of the lectures on history and uh, many of you, probably most of you, have encountered factor analysis in your reading, perhaps even in your own laboratory work or if you've taken a good multivariate stats class. I want to summarize a little bit or, or describe a little bit on uh, about factor analysis just because it's so important to have a, a rough sense of it to appreciate the development of various theories of intelligence and, and other constructs in, in psychology, but maybe especially intelligence. Okay, so definitions from intelligence. We can start here with a uh, the classic uh, Far Side comic about the school for gifted children. Now, obviously, intelligence is a construct, it's an abstraction, but it's something that we believe we can measure and quantify at least in some way, some probably many different ways. Um, and when we think about the relationship between these ways of measuring and the thing that we're trying to measure, we're grappling with the idea of operational definitions. An operational definition is a definition of a thing, in this case a construct, in terms of how it's measured. Uh, and operational definitions exist throughout uh, science. Uh, psychology uh, does not corner the market on these things, uh, but often in psychology we, we lean heavily on operational definitions because we're almost always dealing with abstractions, constructs which again we can't easily or directly observe. And this has been uh, the way throughout the entire history of psychology and uh, indeed E.G. Boring, famous psychologist and historian of psychology, uh, joked about this way back in the 20s saying that intelligence is what intelligence, what the intelligence test tests. Well, that may be sort of funny, but there are some problems with this definition. And of course, Boring kind of meant it as a bit of a joke. The problems or the limitations are that this is obviously circular. Uh, we're inventing tests to measure intelligence, not to define it. Um, also, there's at least the possibility or, or the, the risk that in leaning or relying too heavily on an operational definition, uh, we restrict our exploration of the construct. We focus on some feature, some observable feature that we have a test for or we can easily make a test for, and we ignore other things which we don't at this point in time have a test for or can't easily make a test for. Uh, so we can um, you know, indulge in a certain amount of philosophical circularity in our thinking. We can also, in sort of looping back around and around, avoid thinking uh, or restrict ourselves from thinking more deeply or more carefully about the construct. And uh, we can necessarily, or almost necessarily, get ourselves into a kind of conservative cycle of theory development and test development where we're just validating our new tests against old tests. Um, you know, we have a new test for intelligence and we, we try and decide how, uh, how uh, valid it is mostly by comparing it to existing tests, which themselves were compared to tests uh, existing previous to them and so on and so on. Um, 
none of this is to say the operational definitions are bad. You know, they are, they are neither good nor bad. They're, they just are. And they're certainly a part of science, especially maybe a part of psychology. But we have to be aware of their limitations. And they come up all the time. They come up maybe especially in intelligence because intelligence is a, a value-laden construct. It's something that we care about for personal reasons, I think almost every single one of us. We can make a slight distinction, uh, maybe not a slight, and let's say an, a real and important distinction between operational definitions and real definitions. A real definition is an attempt to define the construct in terms of its true nature, you know, what intelligence really is. Uh, now, that's not an easy thing to do, as you can well imagine, or as we'll see in just a few more slides. Um, operational definitions they have limitations, but at least they're easy to come up with. You know, this test, you know, this construct is what this test of it measures. Real definitions are probably a little bit harder to come up with. And often how we come up with them in psychology is we ask uh, people, we, we, serve, we talk about it, we have a meeting, as, have, as often happens in academia. We ask people, experts and non-experts, what they think, in this case, intelligence or mental ability really is. And we try to come up with some sort of a diversity of opinions or maybe a consensus of opinions about what intelligence really is. Hopefully if we do that, that gets us somewhere close to a quote, real definition, unquote, as distinct from an operational definition, which is uh, a function of or a product of a particular testing approach. So here's something to try. You're experts, or at least you're training to be experts in psychology and in clinical psychology, and maybe especially at this moment in testing. What are your definitions or what is your definition of intelligence? think about this for a few minutes and if you have the time and space try and write it down you know try to come up with words to express what you think intelligence is now, as you're doing that or as you're thinking about it I'll give you a little bit more information uh, and that is uh, you know when we do this type of exercise you know when we ask people for their definitions of intelligence and specifically when we ask experts people who work in psychology who study in clinical or developmental psychology, they look at the uh, mental abilities, how we test them, and so on and so on. Among the experts, there's a diversity of opinions. I mean, the joke is that there are as many definitions for intelligence as there are people who claim to be experts on intelligence. And this is a joke, but it's based in reality. I, mean, I remember uh, way back in undergraduate, probably I think sophomore year or junior year, taking a class on um, intelligence. Uh, this is uh, around the time that Hernstein and Murray released their book, the, the Bell Curve. And in academia, there was an enormous amount of interest in sort of addressing that book and refuting some of its claims about what intelligence is and how heritable it is and so on and so on. Suffice it to say that where I went to school, there were some people who were experts on intelligence. They'd done a lot of research in the area and they offered some classes and I took one of them. And uh, one of these teachers, a guy named Stephen Cece, did something like this. You know, he uh, sent out a letter to his colleagues, you know, the people he went to conferences with, who were all uh, experts on mental ability and mental ability testing, and asked them for their just short answer definitions of what intelligence is. And he showed them to us in class, and yeah, would you guess? Of course you would. There were as many different definitions as there were people he mailed out to, and there wasn't an enormous amount of agreement among them. I say there wasn't an enormous amount of agreement. There are some areas of, of commonality or consensus, and that's true in this one class I took all the way back when, and it's true in more recent and more sort of formal uh, study of this. Um, those points of agreement are things like the capacity to learn from experience, and perhaps relatedly, the capacity to adapt to the environment. So the idea is a, a relatively uh, more mentally able person, a relatively more intelligent person, can more easily or more quickly uh, learn a new ability or a new skill or a new procedure, can learn from experience he or she has with the environment, can perhaps in relations that adapt to the environment better, faster, more efficiently, whatever, than someone who has less mental ability or less intelligence. Now that's what the experts think. And if you pause for just a moment and reflect upon uh, those points of consensus, you may start to puzzle and think, wait a sec, is, is that 
How does that look like an intelligence test? I mean, if you've taken an intelligence test or if you have some familiarity with them from reading your textbook, um, you may start to wonder, if that's the definition of intelligence that the experts have, are we actually making tests that measure that? Mm, we'll see, maybe yes, maybe no. But setting aside the experts for a moment, let's think about the non-experts, people who are, are not deeply studied in psychology, who are not by profession researchers or clinicians in the area of testing and ability and so on and so on. Uh, what do they think? Now, this isn't just kind of a, a trivial exercise to ask what non-experts think. As a general point, we can talk about the so-called linguistic hypothesis. This is that common language uh, should indicate meaning. And thus, if we want to know what something uh, is or what something means, it makes sense to ask people just generally. So, um, you know, the linguistic hypothesis is much used in the area of personality testing, for instance, so rather than come up with a, a formal definition as to what, um, you know, what neuroticism mean, uh, is or means, we can instead rely upon natural language to indicate the things that go along with neuroticism. Where we ask people, what's a neurotic person look like? Where they act like? And those pieces of information that come back to us in the answers should tell us something deep and meaningful about the thing, neuroticism. And by comparison or by, you know, or in connection to that, we can say in the case of intelligence or ability, we can ask people, common people, what does intelligence mean to you? Now, if we do this, there are some points of agreement with the experts. Um, you know, for what it's worth, non-experts tend to describe intelligence as at least having something to do with problem solving. Um, and that makes sense, uh, probably. I think to most of us that seems reasonable. And again, this is something that experts tend to identify, the ability to solve problems or, or learn or adapt to the environment. And uh, again, it, we'll see this a little bit more in future lectures, but we do have intelligence tests, ability tests, which have this type of problem solving quality to them. So for instance, block design tasks on various intelligence tests probably have something to do with the ability to solve a problem using information in front of you. It's also interesting to note that non-experts uh, will identify things like verbal ability, how much uh, information people can bring to mind and express verbally as being related to intelligence or part of intelligence. And there is some connection here with what the experts think, although I didn't particularly highlight that point earlier. And uh, there is some connection here to what intelligence tests look like. You know, they often involve things like vocabulary areas or subtests or tasks where you have to you know, define different terms or use different terms in sentences and so on and so on. Now it's interesting to note there are some areas of disagreement with uh, the experts or between the experts and the non-experts. Um, in general, the experts emphasize verbal ability um, and include uh, practical intelligence that is, you know, knowing how to do stuff, you know, knowing how to solve particular mathematical calculations and so on. Um, Non-experts tend to emphasize more problem solving. Not that experts don't include problem solving, but non-experts probably emphasize that a little bit more. And also, interestingly, we'll often talk about things like social competence as being an aspect of intelligence. Uh, so you can see there's some, there's some slight differences here, and we might almost be tempted to wonder uh, that experts are kind of looking at intelligence through their lens or from their angle. You know, these are people who develop tests, give tests. Most of these tests involve vocabulary sections and sort of problem solving sections and math sections. Maybe that seems to them like the thing intelligence is. Non-experts, maybe especially people working outside of academia, you know, think about intelligence in a different way. You know, maybe it's solving problems at work or being socially competent in teams and groups and so on. Um, so the important point here is that there's some disagreement about what intelligence is, you know, what the real definition of intelligence is. And if we think about that idea, although it's probably not really surprising to us, it should raise some questions uh, in our minds when we consider how we go about testing intelligence. So when we think about a given test of intelligence, we might well ask, what is the content validity of this test? How well does it capture the universe of, of material that should be on a test of intelligence? We could also ask, uh, maybe at kind of a deeper level, what is the construct validity of this test? How well is it matched to the sort of the deep structure of what intelligence is? Not just does it have items that seem to pull at the different parts or measure the different parts of intelligence, but does it in a meaningful and kind of theory-related way measure 
the the sort of curvature and shape of intelligence in its abstract sort of deep state. Now, if that's not confusing enough, uh, or at least you know, if that doesn't raise enough questions in your mind, consider this: um, <clears throat> most definitions of intelligence, mental ability, uh, come from a very Western cultural perspective, and that's true of both experts and non-experts. And reflecting upon that, you may well ask: Are there other perspectives on intelligence? Well, you know, of course there are. Uh, I'm personally a little bit uh, reluctant to in indulge in cultural generalizations um, because I think they're often rather limiting you know, to say Western people believe this, Eastern people believe that. It's, culture is big and fluid and changeable and I think we ought to be a little bit careful about generalizations. <laughs> it's like the old joke, all generalizations are false, even that one. Um, anyway, it, but it's worth considering. Are there, broadly speaking, some differences in the way people of different cultural backgrounds tend to think about intelligence? And the answer is, yeah, there are. Um, you have a sense already, and you will see in future slides in this lecture and future lectures, kind of roughly what Western people think about intelligence and how it should be tested. Generally speaking, in uh, among Eastern cultures, uh, cultures in Asia, there are uh, ideas of benevolence and humility and good judgment, which get kind of folded in with intelligence. So if you ask, you know, non-experts, experts as well, but especially non-experts in Asian countries, you know, describe intelligence, what's it mean, uh, things like being able to get along well with other people, being you know sound in your judgments, being humble in your comportment, um, these things come up as part of what intelligence is. Those they don't really come up as much in Western cultures. Um, if you ask those questions in uh, African cultures, you know in the countries of Africa, you often hear uh, answers like that involve things like. Um, social interactions, uh, you know, understanding and being able to work with social bonds and connections. Not that these things are entirely absent in, in the thinking of Western folks, but they are probably de-emphasized, at least as compared to folks from traditionally African cultures. So again, uh, you know, this important point I, I'm sort of returning to here is that once we get to the, to the, the point of making a test of intelligence, we're necessarily including some abilities, so in a kind of a, a rather traditional Western test of mental abilities, there's probably going to be some items about verbal stuff, you know, vocabulary, reading, comprehension, etc. There's probably going to be some problem solving, some block design, some matrix puzzles, whatever. Uh, but there's going to be stuff that isn't included. So when we make our test, we may not include items about practical intelligence. That is, you know, kind of solving problems in the real world, you know, negotiating, uh, you know, business transactions or social transactions. There probably aren't going to be items about social competence. Again, this gets to that idea of those ideas of content validity and a, at a deeper level construct validity of our testing. In reflecting upon this, you might be reminded of the idea of ecological validity. Ecological validity, uh, which you probably heard about in research methods or maybe even statistics classes, um, is the idea that a measurement or a manipulation that you use in a study ought to resemble the thing that it's trying to measure in the real world. So if you um, have a task that is designed to measure people's level of aggression in your laboratory, it's some sort of you know, computer game task. Uh, a critic might say, well, you know, this task has low ecological validity because it doesn't, you know, being aggressive in this video game doesn't really resemble real aggression in the real world, you know, punching and hitting or even shooting people in, in the real world. Uh, it's a critique of ecological validity. It sort of hinges on this idea that the way in which we measure something, our operational definition, our, our measurement, our manipulation, whatever, ought to um, ideally be like or resemblant to that thing as it manifests in the real world. Um, and so the point I'm trying to make here is, is just that, um, you know, a test resembles behavior in an environment and most intelligence tests resemble school behavior. So uh, if your claim is that um, a lot about what it means to be intelligent is to be good at school, at least school in kind of a modern Western sense of what school is like, then maybe intelligence tests have great ecological validity. Maybe they have other features of validity as well, you know, predictive validity. Um, they, you know, someone's score on an intelligence test is fairly predictive of how well they'll do at school. 
Um, however, if your, your concept or your notion of intelligence is something different that it maybe has to do with being able to negotiate uh, social interactions in the real world or solve practical problems, then you might think, gosh, our tests of intelligence have very poor ecological validity. They don't look like these things. And you might not be surprised to find that they're not, don't have other features of validity uh, very well either. Um, you know, they're not very predictive of how happy you'll be or how successful you'll be at leading a team and so on and so on. Yeah, there's an old New Yorker cartoon that I found online. I saw this years ago, um, and it, it kind of makes the point, although I suppose it indulges in a certain amount of uh, cultural stereotyping. You know, the uh, fellow with the loincloth and headdress holding the piece of paper is saying to the other guy who's either an anthropologist or perhaps just a tourist visiting, he's got a camera and a safari hat, he says, you can't build a hut, you don't know how to find edible roots, and you know nothing about predicting the weather. In other words, you do terribly on our IQ test. The important point is that testing occurs in a context. You know, I've said that before in this class. I probably should say it again and again because I believe it to be true. And culture is part of that context. And culture includes things like our ideas about what intelligence is, what it's associated with or connected to at a kind of a deep level. And um, unsurprisingly, our tests are going to be somewhat limited or bounded by those notions. More important points or, or ideas, I guess, uh, intelligence or ability testing is tricky. Um, there are lots of areas of psychological testing that are hard to do. You'll see that, uh, you've probably already seen that in this class, and you'll certainly see it in the future as we get into areas uh, like um, you know, cognitive abilities and, and uh, personality. Testing in psychology is hard. I mean, it's fascinating, but it's really hard. Um, in the you know, in the area of intelligence or ability testing, there's some consensus um, about what the definitions, the real definitions uh, of intelligence uh, are or should be, but it's limited and it's probably somewhat culture bound. You know, how we in America at this point in history think about intelligence and how we test it is different than how people thought about intelligence in the past or indeed how they think about it at the present in other places. Um, and the consequences of this can be significant and may specifically be disadvantageous to some groups as compared to others. You know, as you remember, hopefully from the history lectures, uh, when we take tests developed in one culture, especially you know, normed in one group and apply them to other groups, we're wading into the deep waters of uh, potential test bias, mismeasurement, all sorts of big problems that we ought to at least be kind of mindful of. I've used the phrase already, I'll return to it again, test bias. Test bias uh, refers strictly to uh, a situation in which the interpretation of test results um, works to the advantage or to the disadvantage of one group as compared to another. So if there's a sort of a differential impact of using a particular test across people of different genders or sexual orientations or ident identities, or if there's a differential impact of using a particular test across people of different ethnic or cultural groups, uh, especially if that differential impact is you know, works to the advantage of one group and the, to the disadvantage of the other, uh, we might think this is evidence of test bias. So if we find that um, black or African American students tend to do worse on intelligence tests than do white or Caucasian students, unless we have a theory that suggests that there are real group differences in intelligence between these two groups, then we are forced to consider the possibility that our test is biased so as to make folks who are African American or black look less intelligent than folks who are white or Caucasian. If you think back to the uh, lectures on history, you'll hopefully recall that there are examples of times in which uh, tests have been used uh, to gather data on the ability or the intelligence of different folks and the differences observed on average between black uh, or African American people and people from other races or ethnicities have been used to justify racist attitudes and beliefs about differences in intelligence between the races. Uh, and more recently in history, there's a lot of concern over the achievement gap between black or African American students and their white counterparts. Uh, one thing that often comes up when people can reflect upon this history or consider this current issue is the idea of test bias. Maybe tests are constructed in a way or delivered in a way, uh, administered in a way such that they tend to 
put uh, African American folks who are test takers at a disadvantage, and that could contribute to these problems and, and ultimately lead to uh, erroneous or biased conclusions about differences. Perhaps unsurprisingly, concerns over test bias, especially in the area of ability or intelligence testing, have led to attempts to develop culture fair testing, originally called culture free testing. The idea here being that you could have a test which would measure ability in a way that doesn't have anything really to do with the culture of the person who's taking the test. So it can't. Uh, or at least m only very minimally uh, advantages or, or disadvantages one group of folks over another. And there are some examples of culture free or uh, culture fair testing uh, for ability. They often uh, have some common features. You know, they tend to be nonverbal tests. The obvious reason that people differ in terms of their language across many cultures. Um, they try to have little obvious connection to schooling because again people differ in the amount of schooling they get or the type of schooling they get uh, around the world, different cultures. Um, they often, these culture fair tests, emphasize fluid rather than crystallized intelligence. We'll talk about this a little bit in future lectures, but basically fluid intelligence is that um, ability to form associations, make connections, learn stuff, uh, bring information in. Crystallized intelligence is this idea of the stuff you already have learned, the stuff that's already in your mind that you can work with. Um, on a more practical level or more surface level, culture fair tests often depend upon things like matrices, series, and series, analogies, etc., which are designed to get at that idea of learning new stuff. You know, can you pick up the pattern? Can you notice the connection? Especially if those things that you're seeing in the pattern don't have any obvious link into language or schooling or so on and so on. Put more simply, these are often uh, tests of inductive reasoning using nonverbal figural stimuli. So, with picture puzzles, uh, can you get at how good or how poor people are at inductively reasoning? Um, and that actually has a long history. The idea that inductive reasoning, that noticing connections, is part of intelligence goes way back to the like the early days of intelligence testing, uh, which was you know at the time referred to as the education of correlates, being able to teach yourself, educate yourself about relationships between elements in a matrix or elements in a series. If you're having trouble visualizing what all this looks like, try these. These are some puzzles. Uh, well, two puzzles that are designed to look like they came from the Raven's Progressive Matrices set. So they are, um, you can see here, it's a, it's, a, it's a matrix, each one is a matrix, and you just have to pick the correct element that appropriately uh, fits in the series. And I won't tell you the answers. So you can ask, like, are these culture fair? Uh, probably not. I mean, they're probably better than the, uh, the many other ways of measuring mental ability, but all tests are based, at least to some extent, in culture. They have to do with how you're educated, you know, beliefs about what intelligence is or how it works, attitudes about testing, and it's really hard to separate testing from culture. I mean, some cultures just test more than others. Our culture, you know, modern Western American culture in the 21st century, tests a lot. We think a lot about testing. That's a that's a thing that we concern ourselves with a great deal. Other cultures, just generally speaking, don't even do that as much. So it's a uh, it's questionable whether any test can really be culture free or even culture fair. Um, that said, I think it's reasonable to uh, give credit to the people who've worked in this area that if you were to develop a nonverbal test and if it had a lot to do with puzzles that involve correlates, um, you know, noticing correla correlations, probably you're moving in a more culture fair direction than if you came up with a test that involves vocabulary, math procedures, uh, puzzles that are resemblant to a particular type of puzzles that you find in school, and so on and so on. So with all that in mind, let's sort of shift gears a little bit, and I'm going to give you my primer on factor analysis. And by primer, I mean just a really quick look at some of the interesting and important things about factor analysis. Why I'm doing this now is, as I've kind of already said, because factor analysis is such a big deal in psychology, especially in test development, maybe even more especially in test development for ability, and as we'll see in the future.
future personality tests. So even if you know a little bit about factor analysis, pay attention. If you don't know that much about factor analysis, pay a lot of attention because this I think will be interesting and hopefully ultimately kind of helpful for you. So I've used this word already, uh, factor analysis, or this phrase already. Uh, what factor analysis is, is really a whole group of multivariate statistical procedures that are designed to summarize relationships between variables and summarize them in terms of factors. These factors may represent some sort of underlying construct or facet of a larger construct, but what they are is just a linear combination of variables uh, that help explain correlations between variables. So a factor will sort of try to neatly describe why certain variables, meaning certain items on your test, sort of go together and other groups, uh, other items don't go together. Maybe it's because at some rather deep level, one group of items tend to be fairly intercorrelated and those items are not very intercorrelated with the other items which all go in some other area or some other factor. Now the goals of factor analysis in a way are pretty simple. Uh, they're accuracy and parsimony. And really those are the goals of almost all model building, whether we're talking about univariate statistics or multivariate statistics. In the area of uh, factor analysis, accuracy means trying to explain as much of the covariance as possible. The covariance I'm referring to here is just the idea that if you had a whole bunch of items from a test and you looked at the correlations between those items in a large sample of people, you'd see that some of the items are really correlated with each other, others, uh, some items are not correlated with other items and so on. You've got kind of a, a pattern of, uh, of covariation. Co you know, correlation is just standardized covariation. And you want to explain that. Uh, that's your goal, is to explain as much of that as possible accuracy. But you want to do it with as few factors as possible. You know, at an extreme, you could say, well, I have this test that's got 10 items, and I can perfectly explain all of these items in terms of this 10-factor solution. Well, that's not very parsimonious, because now your factor solution has as many factors as you have items. And you haven't really saved yourself any work in terms of how you think about the test. Uh, however, if you said, gosh, I've got this test, it's got 10 items, I can explain most of the covariance among these items in terms of two factors. Well, now you've summarized a lot in a fairly parsimonious way, because two is obviously kind of a small number. So those are the goals. Keep those in mind as you think about factor analysis. Moving on, there's kind of two forms of factor analysis. I mean, technically, there are lots of different factor analytic techniques, but you could broadly lump them into two piles or groups. <laughs> it's like factor analysis. You can try to explain the variability by forming groups or patterns. One group are exploratory factor analyses. Um, this is where we try and summarize relationships about uh, among variables using an underlying factor structure. So you've got a test, you administer it to a large group of people, you look at the patterns of item intercorrelation to get a sense of what their covariation of items are, and you don't have a firm idea as to what, if any, factor structure there ought to be. You just run the analyses and see what SPSS or SAS or Stata or whatever gives you. The other broad group of factor analytic procedures are confirmatory factor analyses. This is where you test a particular prediction about the factor structure of test data. So you've got your group of people, you've administered your test to them, you want to see what the, uh, or you want to kind of consider the covariation among all the test items, but you have because of your theory of the construct that you're testing, a particular idea in mind that there ought to be three factors or there ought to be two factors, or, or you, you, want to, uh, you want to test that hypothesis. So you run the analysis in a confirmatory way to see if a three-factor solution fits the data better than a four-factor solution or a two-factor solution does. And maybe even more importantly, or as importantly, you scrutinize what those two or three factors are to see if they resemble, in terms of their content, the factors that you would have predicted. That's a confirmatory sort of theory evaluating hypothesis testing way of doing factor analysis. Either way you do it, um, you begin in a fairly simple fashion 
with a correlation matrix. So even whether you know whether you're doing confirmatory factor analysis or exploratory factor analysis, you just begin with that correlation matrix. And kind of like I already said, this is just a table for all the variables that gives you patterns of intercorrelation um, and may suggest underlying structure. So again, you could imagine you've got uh, an item, or I'm sorry, a test with 10 items on it. You administer those 10 items to I don't know, several hundred uh, test takers and you just compute a, a uh, ta or you create a table of computed correlations. How much does item one correlate with item two, with item three, with item four? How much does two correlate with three, with four? How much does three correlate with four, with five? And you could imagine just sort of filling in all the little squares in your table. Now, if the patterns of intercorrelation were really stark, like only you know, this one clump of factors, they're really tightly correlated and they correlate zero with all the other uh, items or these other items, they correlate really well with each other, but they're entirely uncorrelated with all the other items. You could, by visual inspection, just kind of induce that there are two factors here. Um, that's hard to do though. Generally speaking, you know, you'd have to really squint at the data and get lucky. Um, so factor analysis is necessary to kind of move a little bit further than that beyond just visual inspection. Factor anal analysis is complicated. It's uh, frankly a, a set of procedures that I'm not super qualified to talk about. I mean, I've done factor analyses before, but it's been a long time and it's been a long time since I've thought deeply about the math involved. So just allow that you can run these analyses in SPSS or SAS or Stata or R or whatever else. And what you get as a result of your analyses are a is a factor matrix. This is just a table of factor loadings for each variable. It's going to tell you for each variable the amount or the weight that that variable um, has on that factor. How much does item one in your test, you know, question one on your test, weigh on factor one, factor two, and factor three? Let's say there's a three-factor solution. Okay, now about how about item two? Does it mostly load or weigh on uh, factor one, or is it loading on factor two, or maybe it's loading on all three factors, and so on and so on. Um, as I mentioned, I know in class, and as I may have mentioned in a previous video lecture, there are different procedures for extracting factors. Um, again, factor analysis isn't just one thing. There are a number of different ways of doing it. Um, it's worth kind of generally saying they often produce the same or similar results. So if you did uh, a different types of factor analysis with the same data, you're not guaranteed the same results, but it wouldn't surprise you too much if you saw roughly the same results. As I've described in class, and uh, as you know, the book talks about this a little bit, one uh, additional uh, twist, you know, pun intended, I suppose, in factor analysis is factor rotation. And this is where we take factor loadings uh, in space and we move the axes that describe these factors around so as to minimize the number of factors needed to represent our data and maximize negative loadings on factors. We try and get a particular factor solution out of our data. So if that's a little bit vague, how I just described it, here's a, here's a simple example. Let's imagine we've got a set of uh, data. We've got, I think it's 26 different items here. They're from some tests we have. And in our initial factor analysis, we extract two factors, factor A and factor B, and the loadings are plotted like you would just on a piece of graph paper, and they look a little bit like the picture on the left. It seems like a lot of items load on factor A, um, some of them load on A and B, B in the positive direction, some of them load on A and B in the negative direction. It's not a very satisfying solution to look at because it doesn't give you the real impression that there are some items which are mostly just on one factor or mostly on another. I mean, sure, items like 2 and 14 and 1 seem to be mostly loading on factor A and not very much on factor B, but there are a lot of either, other items which load on both factors. And assuming that's a bad thing, assuming we have some reason to think that there are multiple factors and that our items ought to be rather distinctly loading on one factor or another, what we could do is just tip in space our axes. And, and here really, just for the sake of the picture, I've tipped the, uh, I've kept the axes kind of um, 
uh, I've sort of rotated them, but then put them back in the orientation that is similar to the picture on the left. You see in the picture on the right, we had the rotated vectors, which we're now calling Roman numeral one and Roman numeral two. And here, it's the data, those, those items have the same sort of in space relationship to each other. They just now have a different relationship to the different axes that we've created. Now we've got a situation where most items are loading mostly on one factor and not on the other. You know, sure, there are items like 23 and 24 that kind of load on both factor 1 and factor 2. But other than those, most items are kind of either on factor 1 or on factor 2. And if it makes sense when we actually scrutinize the content of those items, uh, then you know maybe that's an appealing solution. Like, oh yeah, factor one really looks like it's all the verbal stuff. Those are those items are all the items that have to do with uh, asking and answering language-based questions, vocabulary, reading comprehension, and so on. And all the items that load on factor two mostly are things like solving math problems or visual spatial puzzles. Maybe that makes sense to us. It kind of comports with our, our notion of, of what uh, the, of what intelligence should be or, or mental ability should be. So we like that solution more than the original solution where things were a little bit more sludgy and vague. Now, as I mentioned in class, and as I, I might have mentioned already in this lecture, uh, an additional twist, pun intended, I suppose, on, um, on factor analysis is factor rotation. Um, when we rotate factors in space, we can allow that those factors uh, remain at right angles to each other, those, uh, those axes remain at right angles to each other, um, or we can allow that they will become non-orthogonal uh, to each other, they will uh, not remain at right angles to each other. Uh, if we do that, we end up with an interesting outcome where the factors are now correlated with each other. To the extent that an individual test taker elevates one factor, they're necessarily going to be elevating the other factor at least somewhat if they're positively correlated factors. Um, and that's actually not a bad thing that can be interesting, especially if we believe that those factors uh, ought to, at a deep level, be correlated with each other. And indeed, in the history of psychology and the development of tests, really a lot has been made about allowing uh, factors to be correlated with each other because it suggests kind of a hierarchical relationship between uh, the elements within a construct. So if we imagine a construct uh, like intelligence having these uh, factors that make it up, maybe like visual spatial ability and uh, in you know a verbal ability and um, I don't know maybe social competence if we want to measure that we could have all our little items on the test load on maybe mostly one of those factors, but those factors themselves can be correlated with each other. Maybe uh, verbal ability and visual spatial ability are fairly highly correlated, or or maybe they're not, and maybe verbal ability is more correlated with social competence than it is with visual spatial ability or something like that. You know, those those relationships can be useful and they can be meaningful especially if they're predicted by our theory for what the construct is. So factor analysis I think is really fascinating, although it's again to be clear not something I do a great deal or at least I haven't very recently, but there are some issues that we need to keep in mind uh, when we think about factor analytic work. Um, one is variables. Uh, factors can only contain the variables that are in the analyses. So um, what that means is, you know, if you have a test of intelligence and it has good content validity, it means it has lots of items that broadly sample from the universe of content that ought to be on the test, then your factor an analysis may be really informative about the structural nature of that content, how it relates, how those elements of content are organized or relate to each other on a deep level. If your content validity is crappy, if your initial selection of items was just poor, um, you're not getting anything magical out of factor analysis. Factor analysis only works with the items that you give it, like any other statistical procedure. Likewise, uh, sample, you know, your sample has to be uh, representative of the population you're, you're interested in. It also has to be pretty big. Um, I sort of hinted at this before, but like many multivariate techniques, factor analysis requires lots and lots of participants. Um, 
it's not, uh, you know, there are different rules of thumb about this and probably some are more finely tuned than others, but the one that you often read is you need at least uh, five participants per variable. So if you're going to do a factor analysis of a test that has, you know, 100 items, you need to have at least like 500 people in your sample in order to uh, be able to do a proper factor analysis. And maybe, you know, an, you know, point to emphasize here is that this is really a complex process um, that involves a lot of subjective decisions. This isn't as simple as feeding data into the computer and hitting run and allowing the computer to solve it all for you. There are subjective decisions to be made, like what variables to include in your initial testing, the size and the representativeness of the sample, methods for extracting factors, methods for rotating those factors, and as you can guess probably by my somewhat rambling and it points rather vague description of all this, the math involved is fairly sophisticated and you need to be pretty sharp to be able to interpret it. Now many of you can or probably all of you can and some of you will uh, take uh, classes on multivariate statistics so you may well learn all this stuff or I may one of these days relearn this stuff uh, but suffice it to say it's, it's complicated. We need to have kind of a healthy respect for that level of complexity. The important points here, uh, just to kind of wrap this a little bit up, is that factor analysis is used a lot in test development to explore uh, the latent structure of constructs, to evaluate construct validity. Again, if you uh, if you have a, a theory that uh, a particular construct, intelligence or mental ability in this case, has a certain deep organization, it involves certain facets or features, then one way to test that theory uh, is to make a prediction that there ought to be three factors and they ought to look like whatever and then actually go out there and do a factor analysis and see do you have three factors do those factors have the content that you would have predicted if yes then you have supported in general the, the uh, validity of your con uh, the construct validity of your test your test looks the way you predicted you would expect it to given what you think the construct looks like um, so it's really really useful uh, but like I said in um, in the previous slide, like all data anal analytic work, it involves a lot of decisions, items, samples, procedures, and so on. Um, and these decisions can affect what the final solution of the analysis looks like, what you know, what the construct looks like. So, um, you know, it's tempting, I suppose, in the era of modern computing to run lots of stats, lots of analyses, but you have to always keep in mind that your results are only ever going to be as good as the data that you feed into them. Uh, into the analyses. And that's true of factor analysis. It's obviously true of pretty much all other statistics as well. Okay, so if you've hung out with me for this long, thank you for your attention. We've covered a little bit about just kind of the uh, the uncertainty that we have as to what intelligence, you know, in a sense really is. I've talked a little bit about culture. I've talked a little bit about factor analysis, which is just this interesting uh, really set of tools that we use. Um, what about next time? Well, next time we're, we're going to get more specific, or I'm going to get more specific, talking about the history and development of fairly specific tests of mental ability, talk about some of the theories that underlie them, and kind of the form that they take. In between now and then, just uh, relax, take it easy, you know, make yourself a cup of coffee, a cup of tea. Uh, gosh, before recording this lecture, I had a cup of tea which just changed my whole way of thinking. And I, maybe that I was just tired or in a bad mood. But I had a really strong cup of tea and all of a sudden I was like, man, I, I can do this. I can do this lecture. I, I can be the person I want to be. Let's, let's, let's make it happen. It was a life-changing moment for me, um, which probably says more about my sleep habits and level of fatigue than it does about tea per se. But suffice it to say, I would strongly encourage the consumption of caffeine when thinking about uh, psychology and psychological methods and testing and assessment. And with that rather confusing conclusion, I'm done. Catch you later.